Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast exploring Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And I'm Jimmy Fowler, Elder Canada at Redeemer Fellowship. Happy Saturday. Happy Saturday. Why do you always say what I say after I say it? Uh, It's the only thing I know to say after you say, so I say what you say. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that makes you the follower and me the leader. It's all right. Sounds about right. Does it it really sound about right? See? (laughs) Hey, thanks for bringing these Diet Cokes. Can you drink quieter, though? You're drinking really loud. You're like, like, yeah. I'm not. That's still good because you brought this and I already had a. Yeah, you already had one. one. I've got, I'm double fisting my Diet Cokes. No, yeah. I mean, that's just rude of you Mm -hmm. to not think of me. I thought of you when I, when I brought you one. Yeah. uh, But you didn't think of me when you brought yourself one. No, because you weren't here. Dude, I, I got here at 6.30. Oh, so you got you brought it back up? I brought it back up. <laughs> <laughs> that aspartame is going to eat your brain and uh, give you cancer. Mm. Aspartame will make you fatter. Oh, yeah. That's what they say. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. Everybody, uh, everybody's, I know, we need to not drink. We know we need to not drink Diet Coke. We know it's bad for us. But, but you know. We're not, not going to stop. I'm not going to stop drinking it. No. Not yet. No. So oh, here and, we are. We're and, here. Let me just say. Oh, here we go. Um. Okay, so there, I, we released a video. Pastors and cars. Everybody's happy. Pastors yeah, yeah, yeah. and cars. Smoking cigars. Oh, back here, on. I know. I, you know, right. I love this. Okay. I love so all let me this. Just, let me just say. Yes. Let me just say. Yes. I want to address two kinds of yes. people out there. We, yeah. we, we received some feedback. No, no, no. Well, you received feedback. But we, we received no, the feedback. Received it was about that. me. It, it's the feedback. But it was, but it was it's the feedback. I, I, no, it's the feedback I give you oh, stop. every time we're in the car. Right, so here's it. Jimmy has always reminded me. To Put buckle, your seatbelt on. Okay, you're right, right, right. And I appreciate that. Let's appreciate that. Appreciate you, bro. Yeah. Appreciate, um, appreciate. All right. So I wasn't wearing my seatbelt in that video. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm. so, so to, to those of you who were like caps locking, like freaking, why aren't you wearing your seatbelt? Uh, mind your business. Stop. And for those of you, uh, like a lady that wrote in today, uh, who expressed concern and said, hey, you know what, just for the sake of your family, I hope that you will wear your seatbelt. I receive that humbly and gratefully, and you can count on me wearing my seatbelt whenever that camera is rolling. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, rest assured that we have they have a life insurance policy. Oh, yeah, they, <laughs> they do. I got to say, uh, I think life in, in some ways would be a lot easier for my family if I died. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, there'd be a whole lot less complaining mm-hmm. and uh, there'd be more money. Yep. A um, lot less whining. Lo- the house wouldn't smell like cigars. No, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have my so, beard hairs all over when I trim it. Yeah. So, so, Joe, I mean, what is it about you and in your heart? Mm hmm. Where you re- you have to resist authority. I'm not resisting authority. You, yes, you no, do. I'm not. Stop no, I'm it. Not. Yes, no, I'm not. Because no, I'm not. of your libertarian views of no one could tell me what to do. No, no, no. no. Have you not said that? Tell me. I've have you- never said that a day in my life. Oh, you are. <laughs> Thank you. All right, listen, don't make me call you I out say. as a liar. I don't, I don't like people bossing me mm-hmm. when they don't have the right to boss me. But hold on, though. But there is the right in the sense that they are in a position of authority and the law says... Buckle up. Okay, you fine. are resisting the well, law of the no, land. No, no, sir. I'll buckle up. I will buckle up. I just oh, forget. Yeah, you, I no, forget. No, I forget. no, you don't. No, you I don't. forget. The thing, the thing beeps, and you go, and you you physically go and hit the button. Oh yeah, yeah. Do I? Yes. Do you? Uh, you actually will silence it for me sometimes. Enabler. Don't, yeah, don't call me. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll be sitting there, and I don't have my seatbelt on. It'll beep, and Jimmy will reach over and just shut it off. Because I've, I, you know what? I've given up on you. Mm-hmm. I've given up. All right, listen, no, no, no. I'm going to be wearing my seatbelt. You guys can check. You guys can ask me, Jimmy. Jimmy will check and let you know. I'm always wearing my seatbelt now, all the time. I feel like you're lying. Somehow. I'm not lying. No, I'm. I'm going to do it. Okay. But the, here's the thing. Mm. The government. Oh, here we go. <laughs> no, the government. The government. The government should not. I don't know. I, I, how can the government pass a law that tells me I have to wear a seatbelt in my car? Mm. I, don't, I, I don't like that. Yeah, go back to the gold standard. No, uh, this is not a Rush Limbaugh <laughs> thing. I wanna, uh, th- he's a Republican. Look, look. Uh, I just, I just, I think the government should stay out of our business. That's all mm. I'm saying. Mm. Like, now, uh, you know, mm. it, 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 Sunglasses when you're riding a motorcycle, I get that mm-hmm. because you can't see. Mm-hmm. Rock flies yeah. up, you endanger other people. Mm-hmm. Helmet, so, helmet while you're on a motorcycle. No, because it doesn't endanger other people; that endangers you. They should leave you alone. That's why Illinois has no helmet law, mm-hmm. and I like I appreciate mm-hmm. I- Illinois. Appreciate, appreciate you. you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's. Nobody cares about this stuff. Let's talk. No, about, apparently they do because yeah, they, they wouldn't don't. leave you alone. No, it's because they care about me. And the example that you're setting, 
I know. You know I what? Know. And that's the other part. Mm-hmm. How, how inconsiderate of you yeah. to not only you, you didn't you, you disobeyed the law. You I wasn't really you, thinking you about it when we recorded you don't, the video. Yeah, but you don't consider your family. No, I, not I wasn't considering your impact on other yeah. people's lives and those that yeah. are watching. Well, it's because you know I I don't. I do you don't, want to take? The, do you want to take this time to apologize? Well, I want. I want. I am sorry that I didn't know that I was such a big influencer out there. <laughs> you know, I didn't. I, I'm sorry that I was unaware mm. that I'm a big deal and that. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and I didn't I understand. Love I, I love this how backhanded. powerful <laughs> my my example was. So. Uh, I guess it's a humble brag sort of a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm really that was, sorry that mm. that I I blew it and didn't appreciate just how uh how many people look to me, mm, look yes, up to me, yes. and look to follow me. No, they don't look up to you. Hey, <laughs> I think, well nobody can know. But okay, so if they're laying down, yeah, they might. They can. They, they might. can look up to me. All right, so we're we're actually we're back in mm-hmm. um, Graham Goldsworthy Gospel and Kingdom. But here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna wrap it up. Yep. We're gonna button it up. Uh, I know you guys are having fun, but uh, we got we, we've read the book. We got other stuff we want to get to, yep. and um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna kind of uh, we're gonna cursory go through a cursory. Mm, I don't know summary. We're gonna sum- summarize. Yep. We're gonna mm, we're gonna. We're going to big picture this. Yeah. So what we're going to do is uh, we're just going to very quickly go over chapters, what, six, seven, six, eight, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Well, no, we're going to go through. Uh, we're going to make sure we hit nine harder. Yeah, it's all uh, going to be summary. Eh, Even yeah, nine's enough. not going to yeah. be like, you know, we're not going to be 40 minutes or 30 minutes. and that. Fair enough. So, fair enough. But we're, so we're just going to go over this stuff and uh, leading up to chapter nine, which yeah. is all about Christ and the fulfillment of these promises in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you've got your books, we're in chapter six, the gospel revealed in page 58. In, and um, and so we're going to go through there. After this, uh, we're going to be covering some other topics, and yeah. then we're going to come back to uh, biblical theology, and maybe we'll have another book. We'll have uh, some other things. So yeah, yeah. Uh, stay tuned for that. Be sure and send in your recommendations. We always appreciate that. Appreciate you. And uh, as, as, especially those of you who are nice. We appreciate the nice ones. We get a lot of nice ones. We get a lot of nice ones. Yeah. yeah. Very rarely now do we get a mean oh, one. Oh, I know. Since we started putting them on blast. Yeah. Since we started like yeah. reading them out loud. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> they, well, they went down. I'll read them out loud. Mm-hmm. Wait, didn't we get one? I think. Oh, yeah. I didn't read that one out loud. Boy, I did get one. I, I don't remember. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll bring it up. We'll read it at the next all right, time. All right. All right. So uh, here we are. Chapter six. Uh, this, this whole book, Gospel and Kingdom, is about how to understand the Old Testament and yeah. how it relates to the New and how to read it in light of the New. And so we're going back here in chapter six, and we're going to start to talk about the kingdom of God and how it's revealed in each of these different areas or um, epochs. <laughs> eras or epochs in uh, in Scripture or in the history of redemption. And so f- right now, the kingdom revealed in Eden, right? Mm-hmm. In the garden. Is there a kingdom of God in the garden? And really what you see here is... Uh, in the first of all, Jimmy, what does what does he do uh, when he talks about the uh, the components of a kingdom? What has to be in place for there to be a kingdom? I mean, there has to be God's people in God's place uh, under God's rule, right? So that's how you find kingdom yeah. essential qualities, correct? And, that, and that's really helpful. So the question is: is do we see uh, that right? God's people, God's place, God's rule in Eden, and the answer. Well, is yes. Is, is, <laughs> it's, it's it's pretty it's it's pretty clear mm-hmm. on page sixty. Um, he's already introduced the idea of sovereignty yeah. and what it means for God to be king. Yeah. And so here he says, as creation speaks to us of the king, so Eden speaks to us of the kingdom of God. Uh, let's see. He says, the kingdom of God is a holy biblical idea. The concept of the kingdom dominates the whole biblical story. The point where this pattern is established is the Garden of Eden. Here we see the people of God, Adam and Eve in their innocence, the Garden Paradise, the place which God prepared yep. as the perfect environment for his people and the rule of God expressed by his word. Mm-hmm. So again, just because the word kingdom isn't used yep. or covenant isn't used doesn't mean that the reality is not there. Uh, we certainly do see these components. Mm-hmm. And so I think when you say that under God's rule, the word of God, can yeah. you can help people cl- clarify that? Because I know, I know it was already kind of discussed in a previous chapter, but I think what we're kind of talking about specifically here is when uh, God told him to do this, to cultivate, to, to work it, uh, but the law do not take from the... Right. Yeah. So there was prescription and prohibition. There yeah. was um, be fruitful and multiply, exercise dominion, cultivate the garden, mm-hmm. uh, you know, get it on, all yeah, that yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. right? You know, uh, and so do these things, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. Uh, now... Implicitly, though, there are other commands and other restrictions. 
don't murder your wife. Yeah. Don't, um, you know, don't, uh, don't lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, those, those aspects of the law, though not explicitly given, were still there. They're still inherently true mm-hmm. and good because they stem from the very character of God. Yeah. So God's word, they didn't have the Bible, but they did have God's word given to them directly. Yeah. And that was the, uh, the means by which, you know, he, he exercised rule over them. Yeah. And now it, he's good to say here that, um, that in the garden, we don't learn everything that we can about the kingdom of God. Yeah. It just gives us that basic framework that we see running throughout all of it. Like you said, Jimmy, God's people, God's place. Under God's rule, and so we, you know, we, we see it. It's um, it's pretty clear. In then you know the fall happens. Yeah. So you've got Adam and Eve, uh, in the garden. Things are perfect. Satan comes in the form of a serpent, tempts Eve. Um, she falls to the temptation, eats the fruit forbidden, uh, and then she gives to her husband. Mm-hmm. He falls. He eats the fruit that's forbidden. And then ruin, death, misery, destruction, uh, yep. separation from God. All of that happens, and then after that. We have these two lines, right? Yeah, the split, uh, 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 like Cain and Seth. Right, so they have the, the ungodly line of Cain mm-hmm. and the godly line of Seth. So Abel is murdered by his brother Cain, yep. which is awful because Cain is a cooler name. <laughs> Cain is a strong name. I would totally name you, my you, kid you Cain. You would follow Cain? No, no, but I like the name. You like the name? I so mean, like you're like, oh, I wish I could name my kid Cain. All right, like what's better, Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker? Darth Vader's a better name, right? Yeah, well. Okay, see? Yeah. Why is that? Why the bad guys get the good names? Because, yeah, you're right, like, strong. Billy the Kid. That's cool. What's the good guy's name? Nobody even cares. Nobody, I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> Jesse James. No, Jesse James wasn't good. No. But I'm talking about no, who's the, That's another one. That's a good name. That's another good game. Yeah. Doesn't he become good? Doesn't he become a, well, he a become, marshal? No, no, Jesse James becomes uh, like a motorcycle builder. He starts to build motorcycles, and he gets a TLC show. <laughs> He's like, he builds that stuff. Is that the OC one? Yeah, <laughs> that's that guy. All right. Um, but either way, so Cain, so Cain's the godly line, line, and right. Seth, the godly line. And so, you know, from Seth, you know, you've got Enoch and, yep. and Noah, Noah. And from, from that, you know, we get to Abraham. And, um, and so you, we see that happening. So but as. He, but even then, after with Noah, after you still see another split, right? Uh, oh, yeah, of yeah. Lines, right? The, yep. the godless line of Ham. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so there's a bad example. A bad example. <laughs> okay, so there's a bad guy with a terrible name. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, all bow before Ham. No, you got all bow before Ham. <laughs> and then you got Shem. Uh, the uh, 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 just okay, but okay, <laughs> Shem is worse than Ham, though. See, even even when you have two bad names, the bad guy gets the better version. Oh, man. all right. And, so, and then from there, yeah, you have uh, Abraham. Yeah, Abe, <laughs> Abe. All right. So then, after this, uh, in chapter seven, we get into the the kingdom of God revealed in Israel's mm-hmm. history. Right. So we're here. We're talking from Abraham all the way to the Babylonian exile. It's, it's about a thousand years. Yeah. And so you've got, you know, how is the kingdom revealed during this? Like, um, like in how does he talk about it, Jimmy, with Abraham, for example, and the patriarchs? I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, he talks about Abraham's descendants would become a great nation. Mm. From there, these descendants would possess the promised land. And then from there, these descendants would be God's own people. All right, so this is Genesis 12, Genesis 15, yeah. Genesis 17, right? Yeah. So here you have the Abrahamic covenant. And what uh, Goldsworthy says is that um, in Abraham and in the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, the kingdom is promised. Yeah. Right? So the fall has happened. The kingdom was corrupted. But now he's saying the kingdom is going to come. Yeah. It's going to be great. And you guys are going to be a part of it. It's going to come through your offspring. Yep. That this kingdom is 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 going to be a reality. So the, the kingdom is now being anticipated by God's people. Correct. They're looking forward to it. And by the time we get to Moses and the Exodus, now those promises, uh, Goldsworthy says, are being activated, activated yep. right? So um, what's what's interesting about this is, you know, you have, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's sons, Joseph mm-hmm. winds up in Egypt mm-hmm. in a position of authority, The his family line. Do, do you think he uh, uh, wore his seatbelt? As a position, you know, in that position of authority, he wouldn't he have to. You think he obeyed the rule? He, he wouldn't of the have law to. Of the land? He, he was the law. He, he would not. And you know what? Did he dreaded it up. He oh. judge dreaded it. Oh, drop it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I even, am the law. <laughs> I am. I am not even a comic guy, and I, I know I knew some judge dread from back in the day. Um, so uh, Israel, uh, you know, the Joseph's family yep. leaves the land, comes into Egypt seeking help. They. 
Um, they find them. They find Joseph, the brother that they had betrayed in leadership, and instead of crushing them like he should have, um, <laughs> no, like like we would want to, yeah, he yeah. saves them. Israel dwells there in Egypt. They swell in population. Four hundred years go by. There's, there's over a million of them then, and they've been enslaved. So then God raises up a deliverer, Moses, to uh, to set his people free. Of course, Pharaoh is going to resist this. Mm-hmm. Now all of this is most beautifully told in a piece of poetry called Creeping Death by Metallica. Oh my, what and, is wrong uh, with you? You, know, you know the song Creeping Death? <laughs> I don't remember the song. You don't know the song Creeping Death? I don't Death? remember it. I really don't. I don't remember it. Slaves, Hebrews born to serve, to the Pharaoh, heed to his every word, live in fear, wait for the unknown one, the deliverer. It's all about Moses and the Exodus. Okay, okay. It's, I was just, how do you not know this? How do you mm. decide, bro, do you even disciple your children? Nope. Because I was just using this to disciple my kids uh, this week. So yeah, he actually, okay, so Metallica, Creeping Death, great song. They they played at every concert because it's so uh, beloved. And it's biblical. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So check that out. So anyways, uh, Moses is used by God to deliver his people through many acts, miracles, signs, and wonders. And so the people are, are set free, led by Moses. They wind up at Mount Sinai in a covenant Right, another right. covenant, a new covenant, not the new covenant, but a, a new, new covenant, covenant yeah. is is given. So the the Sinai covenant, and this is when God gives His people a law to yes. define them, to rule over them in the land that they will possess. Yeah. Now this law, a lot of people, a lot of people get trippy about the law, and it hasn't helped when we have sort of uh, I don't know popular theologians and pastors who are on tilt and uh, they don't really uh, get the function of the law. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, the law it, throughout uh, the the recorded history of redemption, right? The law serves those three purposes, right? It will restrain evil, uh, you know, through threats of warnings and punishment. Mm-hmm. Um, it will convict you of your sin and show you that you need a, a savior. Yep. But the third use of the law is as well to show you how you are supposed to live. Yes. It's a rule for godly living. Now, even in... And some people are going to push back on that, you know, the, well, especially that third use of the law. For some reason, well, they, you push, can, you, they push ahead. back on it. You know what? You know what happens when you push back on God? Uh, <laughs> he's going to cut you down. So go ahead, push back on God, see what happens. <laughs> so um, he, here's the thing. Um even even in the old covenant, even yeah. in uh, this this Sinai covenant, the law that was given to Israel was not a law given to them so that they could become the people of God, so that they could keep it and then be accepted by God. The law is given to them as God's people. Like at the first of the Ten Commandments, which is the summary of the law written by mm-hmm. the finger of God in stone, what does God say? I am the Lord your God. Your God. Yeah. You shall have no other God before me. So like, it's already established. I'm the Lord that brought you out. I yep. saved you. Yep. You are my people. So here's the law I'm giving you. So the law was not a means by which they would be saved. Mm-hmm. The law was given to a people who were already belonging to God. Correct. So the law uh, in, in this Sinai covenant, and we're not going through all of the covenants, of course. Mm-hmm. Here we're just saying that this is where the kingdom of God again is uh, is beginning to be realized in a sense, in an, in an earthly sense, right? We have law given, God's rule. There's going to be a place yep. when they enter into the promised land, yep. um, which you know we see, we see here in this. Uh, in fact, let me. I lost my place. That's seventy eight. Yeah. So Moses doesn't lead them into the promised land. Who mm-hmm. does? Oh, I just called Jimmy out. You did. You don't know who leads them? No, 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 I do. I do. Oh. Shh, shh. Stop. I know. Stop. Joshua. I'm not too- there you go. Joshua. Gosh, I'm trying to remember like. <laughs> yeah. if, I, if, I, if I ask Jen a question and I pressure her to tell me quickly, she can never do it. It doesn't matter. And that's it, what you were doing. You're sitting there doing this with your hands. It's a gesture. Just, no, don't. That's an encouraging gesture. That's not encouraging. You know that. Like, I just start, I start to That's whisper. an encouraging. Now, this is not an encouraging gesture. But oh, this is an encouraging. That's not. That's not. You were yeah, doing. Because you, you know you're trying to like ramp me up. No, ramp no. me up. Ramp yeah, me up. I'm trying to ramp you up to get it going. Oh, get it God. done. Uh, I got it. I All knew right, it. So, yeah. So, Joshua leads the people in. Now, um, People debate sometimes like whether or not they, they actually did possess the land. But in Joshua 21, 43 through 45, it clearly says that the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and having mm-hmm. taken possession of it, they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. 
and so on. So uh, now Israel would not maintain this. Yeah, right. Yeah. They would they would break their side of the covenant and fall uh, under God's discipline. Yep. But then we have um, so they, they enter into the land, and then we we can go ahead and get into chapter eight, the the kingdom revealed in prophecy. Okay. Right. So the the prophets were the mouthpieces yeah, yeah. of God. They were the ones who would, by God's spirit, they would be moved and they would speak for God. And and the prophets usually were saying two things, right? Um, there's warnings, mm-hmm. threatenings mm-hmm. of judgment, and then there's these promises yeah. of hope and yeah. restoration. So judgment, restoration. These are usually the two things that are coming from the prophets. And there are these two main groups. The way uh, Goldsworthy says, he breaks it down, he says there's two basic groups of these prophets. Yeah, it's the ones uh, before the split. There's, right. there's before the split and after the split of Israel. So was this a Baptist, like, was Israel it, like a Baptist church? They, they were the first Baptist church? They, they split. They split. It was first, and then, but they can't go call themselves second Baptist. No, no. Only Presbyterians do that. Yeah, yeah. So they just went with, like, New New Hope Baptist New Hope Baptist church. Baptist that's church. That's it, that's it, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Israel split, right? Mm-hmm. We had uh, ungodly leadership, yep. uh, the northern kingdom called Israel, the southern kingdom called Judah. And so you had the prophets before that when the kingdom was united, yep. and then you had prophets after that when the kingdom was divided, and then each one went into captivity. Then you have pre-exilic and mm-hmm. post-exilic prophets as well. Now, these prophets, um, what were they essentially doing? We get to it on page 99, really. Um the, the pattern of the kingdom pattern in prophecy. Uh, what does he say there on 99? On 99 um, says here, now we return to the pattern of future hope to which all the writing prophets contributed. It may be summed up quite simply. The form of future history will be a replay of past history, but with a significant difference. Mm. All the hope for the future is expressed in terms of return to the kingdom structures revealed in the history of Israel from the Exodus to Solomon. The great difference is that none of the weaknesses of the past will be present. Mm. In short, sin and its effects will be eradicated. Boom. Boom. Goes right. dynamite. So it's all this, it's this future hope. Now they feel the need for it really again, mm-hmm. right? Because they've broken these old covenant laws uh, they were not able to keep their part of that. It is a the old covenant is a is a kind of a, a covenant of works yeah. in that you know the blessing that you experience the prosperity, uh, the well being of the nation depended upon the obedience of the people. Yeah, uh, but their relationship to God was not based on works. That was still rooted in grace. Correct. So this looking ahead to uh, a, a kingdom in the future, which will be like the kingdoms that we've experienced so far, but without any of those um, defects, without yeah. any of those weaknesses, yeah. that is a new covenant that is going to come. Uh, and those the new covenant hopes that you read about throughout the Old Testament, uh, in particular, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36. Mm. Um, and and it's not just a a rule over people, but it is a rule in people as well, because it's our hearts that are going to be changed, right? The heart of stone will be taken out, heart of flesh will be put in. We're going to have a new spirit put within us. God's spirit will dwell within us. We will be careful to obey his laws. Like there will be these internal changes in us in that new covenant as well. So there's this new covenant hope that begins to really, um, put the sharp point on the prophecies of, uh, of of these prophets in uh, in the old kingdom, particularly as we're getting into those that second group of them. Correct. Yep. So all of that points to <laughs> all of that is getting to chapter nine. All of that is leading us to the kingdom revealed in Jesus. This is this was such a great chapter. Yeah. This is this is really good. You guys, honestly, um, you should. Pro- a lot of you need to read this twice, maybe three times, because you're you're gonna. You, it's likely that you can miss some small things that yeah. are said. It's a very brief chapter. Um, but some of these paragraphs are really important and have warranted full books on the subjects yeah, that he says. Yeah. So, um, yeah, read this carefully, read this slowly. But when we get to this point, Jimmy, what's what's going on? The kingdom is revealed in, in Jesus. What are we saying about the Old Testament and its relationship to the New? Yeah, I mean, uh, he talks about this in the sense that, uh, actually, I really like how he puts it on 
on page 105, Mm -hmm. right? Um, It is important that we understand very clearly that this fact of the Old Testament's progression towards a fulfillment in the the new is not merely an invitation to understand Jesus Christ as the end of the process. It is also a demand that the whole Bible be understood in light of the gospel. It means that Jesus Christ is the key to the interpretation of the whole Bible, and the task before us is to discern how he interprets the Bible. Yes. So there are three things here that you, that we, we want to be very clear on. Yeah. Number one here, implied in this statement is what he says earlier, that the Old Testament is pointing towards the New Testament. The mm-hmm. New Testament is the way that we interpret the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, the Old is anticipating the New. Yep. The New is the fulfillment of the Old. Yep. But then he says um, that this fulfillment of the Old in the New and in Jesus is not just, okay, well, Jesus is the end of these things. That's right. That's just part of it. He's the fulfillment of these things. But then that Jesus is the fulfillment that gives us a means of interpreting Correct. the whole. Correct. How do we interpret Scripture? We do it the way Jesus did. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's going to create some differences between us and, say, dispensationalists. Yeah, yeah. I would right? Because really, and he, he talks about this later on, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, okay, so like there are there are people that will look to see the the promises of the Old Testament fulfilled in a very literal way. Yeah, yeah. And and so there are these different kingdom expressions, right? Eden, Israel, prophetic kingdom, uh, and they they express the kingdom in different ways, but. Uh, we we don't expect them to be fulfilled in literal ways because by the time we get to Jesus and the claims that Jesus makes, the claims that the apostles make demonstrate that, no, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these things. Correct. So one of the things that he says on 109 is that I thought was helpful. The New Testament uh, knows nothing of this kind of literalism. It repeatedly maintains that Christ is the fulfillment of these terms, images, promises, and foreshadowings in the Old Testament, which were presented in a way that is different from the fulfillment. Mm. For the New Testament, the interpretation of the Old Testament is not literal, yeah, that's good. but Christological. Oh. So we like the term literal because it usually pits us against liberals. Yeah. You're either literal or, or you're liberal, liberal right? Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's, and that's not fair, but that is, uh, but it is somewhat understandable, especially during... Um, yeah, it was reactionary. Yeah, because we had liberalism really, you know, uh, wow, I mean... 19th century and 20th century liberalism yep. taking over a lot of our denominations. And so we had dispensationalists holding on to the scripture as the very word of God. They knew it was the word of God. They believed it was the word of God and they wanted to take it literally and not metaphor the Bible away. Yeah. Not symbolize the Bible away and the truths away. But, um, but what, you know, Goldsworthy is saying here is that, well, listen, you, you're not supposed to take these prophecies and, and try to make a one-for-one correlation to a literal interpretation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because, frankly, the Bible itself doesn't do that. Correct. Everybody was like, wait, what? Where, where's the kingdom, yo? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Jesus is like, what's up? Yep. It's right here. Mm-hmm. I can't see it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not the kingdom you're expecting. Mm-mm. Not yet, anyways. So um, that's going to have some some pretty big implications for how we understand the Bible. This is just sort of getting us going. Now, uh, he, has, he has a good statement here on the gospel. I mean, if we're going to talk about the kingdom revealed in Jesus mm-hmm. and we're talking about the Jesus, um, how does he summarize the gospel here for us? I think you were talking to me about that earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. On uh, 107 at yeah. the bottom there, uh, he says, To sum up, the gospel is what God has done for us in Christ for our salvation. And as the two natures of this Christ must be distinguished, uh, he's talking about uh, son of man, son of God, uh, uh, two natures of this Christ must be distinguished. So also we must distinguish what God does for us and what God does in us. Mm -hmm. Likewise, as we must not separate the two natures of Christ, neither must we separate the gospel from the fruit of the gospel. It is by the gospel that we are born again. It is the gospel that evokes true faith and is the gospel which produces the sanctified or spirit-filled life. Now, somehow, all this is related to the Old Testament, and we must try to understand how. So then he goes, that's a really good statement, and then he goes in and he starts to talk about the relationship between the gospel and the kingdom, the Mm -hmm. gospel of the kingdom. And uh, he says on page 108, 
the unavoidable conclusion from the New Testament evidence is that the gospel fulfills the Old Testament hope of the coming of the kingdom of God. Yes. you. I mean, listen, all New Testament scholars, all the gospel scholars that read Jesus, they all say, oh, his emphasis, kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. what he was about. He was always talking about the kingdom of God. Um, he says, but we must be more specific about what this means and yeah. how it has worked out in the New Testament itself. He says later, if the gospel fulfills the expectations of the kingdom, we should be able to discern how this is so by looking at the New Testament evidence. Furthermore, we are now in a position to clarify one aspect of biblical interpretation, the fact that various strata of the kingdom revelation in the Bible define the progressive nature of revelation, yeah. reminds us of the diversity of expression within the overall unity. Each kingdom expression, Eden, Israel, prophetic kingdom, and now gospel, represents the same reality, but is expressed in different ways. So we've already talked about this. Yeah. How in the, the, the whole idea of the kingdom, God's people, uh, in God's place under God's rule mm-hmm. is the is the theme those basic elements and that it is kind of pointed to it is preached about it is hoped in uh, throughout these eras all leading up to this point so in the gospel mm-hmm. in the kingdom of God new covenant style um, how do we understand God's people God's place and God's rule. I mean, really, we're, we're talking the like the people of God in the gospel. The people of God is Jesus Christ. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. What are you talking about? Uh, the people of God are the people of God, and Jesus is the Son of God. Well, no, 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 no. no, no, no. no. The people yeah. of God yeah. is Jesus Christ. No, no, the people of God and this are the Jews. Because, uh, well, because, and the and church, because Jesus is depicted as the true Adam. Okay. He's depicted as the seed of Abraham. Mm-hmm. He is the true Israel, and he is the son of David. Uh, so Jesus Christ is the head of the new race. Thus, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. That is, he bap. belongs to the new order of which Christ is the head. Bap, bada, bam, bap, bap, got him, got him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is great, right? So, so like this, this, this was. I loved this chapter. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a great chapter. So if if you guys will just go to one twenty one, circle that. You can see a yeah. little a little chart there, right? Um, with like Comic Sans font. I don't know oh, what I don't that's like all the about. Font. I don't know like, why. It's, it's like, like I'm reading a Marvel comic. Uh, anyways, <laughs> um, so here you've got God's people, God's place, God's rule yep. in Eden, Israel, in the prophetic era, and in the New Testament. Yep. And so it's really helpful to see um, who are God's people uh, reflected in the kingdom of God yep. in Eden. Well, it's Adam and Eve. What about during Israel and during those... Um, those uh, patriarchal period. Well, it's Abraham. It's Israel under Moses. It's Israel under the monarchy. And then in, in, in prophecy, the people of God are the faithful remnant. But when we get to the fulfillment of all of the promises, in they are found in Jesus Christ. So in the new covenant, Jesus is God's people. Yep. And the new Israel, that's us in Christ. That's like, right. So it's Jesus is the people of God, and because we are in him, we are the people of God. We are now sons of Abraham because we are in Christ. And so, you know, where this kingdom dwells, I mean, he talks about it on, on 113. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> Now, if Israel's hope was that the nation would return to Zion, we must inquire of the New Testament where Zion is to be found. Hebrews 12, 22 indicates that a Jew comes to Zion by being converted to Christ. Zion is where Jesus reigns now at the right hand of God. And this is where we come by faith in the gospel. Yeah. So if Jesus is is the one in whom we dwell, Mm -hmm. right? So God's place, this new temple, this is Christ. That's it. Christ is the temple. Exactly. Christ is Israel. Christ is the temple. Yep. Christ is everything. Christ is everything. We dwell in him, and uh, and Christ dwells in us. This is, I mean, this, this fulfillment of all of those promises is huge and you would never have anticipated it Mm -hmm. no one in the old testament was thinking that this is going to be how it's going to play out correct but it's better it's far better than we could ever dream so be a little careful when you start to think about how uh you know prophecies and predictions are going to be fulfilled Mm. because we usually get them wrong yeah god's kind of got a subjective take on uh on how he's going to all about that name it and claim it no, no, no. no. He did, uh, well, he he names it and claims it because he got. Yeah, but not us. Not, no, you can't. You can't. <laughs> Joe keeps trying to name and claim my diet cokes. Uh, no, I, it doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work. Uh, no, no. It doesn't. All right, so we've got God's people. Yep. In the new covenant, right? It, Jesus, the people of God. Yep. Um, the new temple where Christ dwells. Right. But what about God's rule? 
Uh, here we're talking about uh, the new covenant that you were that you're talking about. Uh, this this heart of flesh, right? This heart mm-hmm. of stone being taken out. This heart of this heart of flesh, um, uh, where it's. I'm trying to think of like the. I can't remember the 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 passage. Where is that? It's at What's Ezekiel. Jeremiah, and yeah, right? Jeremiah Ezekiel thirty six. Jeremiah thirty one. There you go. Thank it's, you. Ezekiel thirty six is where you know he's going to take out your heart of stone and all That's of that. It, yeah. they, they both really say the same thing. But yeah, God rules. He reigns in us, in our hearts. Now that might sound cliche to some people. Oh, yeah. isn't that cute? He rules in your hearts. Well, I don't need him to rule in my heart. I need him to rule in this world because this world's going crazy. Listen, God does rule over all things. He is sovereign over mm-hmm. all things. And while we await the absolute fulfillment of the kingdom in full with the resurrection and judgment and everything, until then, he is now reigning in his people. He gives us a new heart, a new mind, a new disposition, mm-hmm. and we submit to his law. Yeah. It is now no longer a striving uh, against God's law in a battle with God's law, it is we have now been won over by the grace of God, and we delight in the God's law. Yeah, he talks about this on one sixteen. The most detailed exposition of the gospel, as the new covenant of, of Jeremiah is given in Hebrews eight and nine, in saying, as the writer does, that the new covenant is so much better than the old, uh, which has become obsolete. He in no way implies that the old is unconnected with the new. In fact, he establishes the new by showing how it achieves perfectly what the old could only foreshadow. Mm. Yeah. So it's this is I will cause them to walk in my statutes, yes. right? Like this is going to happen progressively, mm-hmm. imperfectly now, mm-hmm. and then ultimately fully and finally when Jesus returns. And so we we have this, right? This idea of the already not yet yeah. or the now and the not yet. Uh, and this is a, a, a really good, clear, uh, way that biblical scholars have tried to summarize the tension yeah. that we that we have as as members of God's kingdom here today. Uh, Christ is reigning. He is, but he is. Like we're redeemed, yeah. but we're still awaiting our redemption. Correct. We're saved, but we're still wait, awaiting our salvation. Yeah. I mean, he talk, Goldsworth, he talks about this on 119. The gospel, the first coming of Christ, wins for believers all the riches of glory. The acceptance of the believer with God is perfect the moment he believes because Christ is and his and his work are perfect. The status of the believer can never be improved upon. He possesses all the riches of Christ. There is nothing the believer will possess in glory that he does not now possess in Christ. All this he possesses by faith, but that is by faith, or sorry, but that it is by faith does not make it any less real. Yeah. Yeah. The Christian thus lives in tension between the now yep. of living by faith and the not yet of knowing the full reality of the kingdom by sight. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that, you know, we, we we do well as we're studying, as we're reading, uh, and particularly as we're living, right, to, to, to lay hold of these realities that we can only lay hold of by faith right now, that yeah. we truly lay hold of them, that they become precious to us, um, that we are in Christ, that we are forgiven, that we are righteous, uh, that we are secure, that God's plan will work out for good, that we, all of these things, we experience them now in part, and we long for the day when they will be sight. So for what we have now, uh, it ought to really matter to us. It mm-hmm. ought to be important. Um, and and the more valuable they are to us, the more content we can be in a world that is broken because we taste what is to come. Yeah, like we can taste it now. We're not having the full feast yet, mm-hmm. but we are tasting it, and that is something. And I love how he kind of uh, concludes this part uh, on page one uh, twenty-two. Says this: the gospel is not simply forgiveness of sins and going to heaven when you die. The gospel is a restoration of relationships between God, man. And the world, mm-hmm. and I think as as kind of putting that fine point that the gospel is everything, Christ is everything, um, and I think what has really helped me in, in going through this has been articulating better what it is I already believe, um, but putting a finer point on it mm-hmm. uh, in better understanding uh, that we are in Christ and and this gospel centered interpretation of Scripture. Which is what chapter 10 is all about. Yeah. So we're we're buttoning it up here, not because chapter 10 is unimportant. Chapter yeah. 10 is eminently important. 
you need to read chapter 10. Mm -hmm. Um, You need to spend time with it. Uh, What we wanted to do was give you a a sense of this book. We wanted to help you understand some of the basic principles that go into understanding the Old Testament. And now we want you to go ahead, read chapter 10, uh, Well, and read read the rest, right? Read chapter 10, read chapter 11. Correct. Because in chapter 10, you get to the principles of interpretation. And that's really the goal here. It's, yes. it's not just to understand history and theology of the Old Testament. It's to know what to do with it, with your own eyes, with your own heart, with yep. your own mind. Yep. So uh, get to chapter 10 now. We're not going to get into it. We got, a lot, we got other things that we're doing. Yeah. But we want you to read chapter 10 uh, and mine it for all that it's worth. And then get into chapter 11 where he goes back over that old illustration mm. about David and Goliath. Well, let us know how uh, what you've been learning. Let us know uh, what you've gotten out of this uh, with the hashtag learn with Jofo. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Doc and Devo or on Facebook slash Doctrine and Devotion. You can head on the website, DoctrineDevotion.com. There you can contact us. You can sign up for our email blast or you can hit up the store and uh, register for the 2018 Doctrine and Devotion Conference on the Spirit and the Church. Joe, we got more books. We, we got did. more stuff. We did. All right. So check it out, guys. The first 200 to register. Well, let's, yes. let's, do, let's do it this way. All right. Go. If you register as a full registrant. Yes. You're going to get some stuff. You're yeah. going to get the T-shirt. Uh, and the journal and the journal for sure. Now, if you're if the if you're the first in the first three hundred to register, yep. What are they going to get? You're going to get the 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 T-shirt, the journal. Uh, you get the CSB uh, Spurgeon Study Bible. That's pretty cool. And a the Spurgeon Journal. Yeah. All right. Now listen that that's new. That yeah. Those are new. So if you're in the so first thanks CSB, three, thanks B and H. Yeah, and all the other abbreviations A B C D E F. Um, <laughs> now we also. The first 300 are going to get, and we're almost, we're like at 250 something, I think. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you guys got to get in and register. Yep. Now, the first 200, these are already gone. The first 200 get everything that we've listed so far. Plus, uh, they get... uh, The Incomparable Christ by J. Oswald Sanders, which is one of my favorites. And On the Block by Doug Logan. Which is one of your favorites. Yeah. I don't like it. I think Doug Logan's kind of hacky. Oh. (laughs) Oh. Diddy, I, I don't, I don't think that... Oh, please. He knows I'm joking. All right. Um... So you guys got to register. Uh, we're going to have over 300 here. Yeah. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but, well, you know, maybe. Well, yeah. If, if, if Jimmy can <laughs> make the wheels fall off of something, uh, there's a pretty good chance. No, man, this is this is a really exciting conference. We're really pumped. So, yeah, get in there. Register while you can because yep. uh, those goodies are going to run out. And then that's all that we can get. That's all. Like, we, that, we tried. We, we've been trying. We, we, we worked, worked hard at this. And the Moody and uh, B&H yep. and the CSB, yep. they've all been very generous. Very generous. Um, we're also going to have some vendors there, some tables there yep. that have super good discounts on stuff. Oh, so yeah. you're going to want to check it out. Fresh Pod every Monday and Thursday. Blog posts on Wednesdays. Video content on Fridays. Later. Later.